My name is Julia Hobsbawm. I'm here to moderate this session, this very on-trend, of-the-moment session to talk about the generation that matters. Uh, with three of the great experts in this field, we have the expert in the field on Gen Z. We have a real live Gen Z person who is responsible <laughs> for millennials. And we have uh, a grown-up who is <laughs> responsible for the whole of the FinTech <laughs> membership bodies. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves in a moment. This is a very interactive session, and I would ask you, if you haven't done so already, to go on your uh, Cybos app, to go on the interact bit of this session if you want to engage in the Slido question. But you could do something very old tech at the end and put your hand up if you want to ask a question. Can I ask a question first? Would you put your hand up if any of you are Gen Z in the room? That's 12 to 23. <laughs> that's a rather ambitious hand from someone who looks <laughs> considerably older, but that's good. Would you put your hand up if someone in your life is Gen Z or millennial? I speak as the mother and stepmother of five <laughs> children. Right. So we're all a little bit hip to this generation. And what we're here to discuss is the fact that for banks, they present a wholly new landscape. So I'm going to ask my experts, Chloe Comby, Joe Harris, uh, and uh, Charlotte Crosswell, to introduce themselves briefly and tell us the key thing for them that matters to finance and banking and this generation. And then we'll knock it about a bit and involve the rest of you. Let's start, Chloe, with you, and then we'll come on to Charlotte, and then Jo. Um, hello, my name is Chloe Comby, and I wrote a book called Generation Z, Their Voices, Their Lives, where I interviewed about 3,000 of the UK Gen Zs, um, and that's kind of expanded and now I'm doing kind of European version. And I'm also doing um, a show with Google um, that's specifically focused on girls, so it's kind of a film um, which would be really interesting. And I guess for, I mean, I mean, there's many things that I'm kind of interested and passionate about Generation Z, but I think from a financial point of view, I think that Generation Z increasingly feel kind of excluded and left out of kind of both the economy and lots of kind of job availability, availability and kind of leg legitimate structures. And I think it's kind of inculcating sort of a feel, slight feeling of hopelessness. So I think from a financial point of view, there needs to be ways to kind of reinvigorate this sense that they're engaged with the economy and they're engaged with this sense that they're going somewhere and there's opportunities for them. Because I think that's incredibly important from both a sociological point of view and also an economic point of view, because you have to have a generation that is going to be kind of supporting other generations and the up and coming generation who feel this sense of ambition and drive. Thank you. Charlotte, what's, tell us about you and your top line perspective, please. Sure. Um, so I don't know, I'm not sure I want to be called a grown up, but anyway, we'll work with that. <laughs> um, I do have an 11 year old, so I do, I definitely see Gen Z. Um, you see, for me, I spent 25 years in capital markets, um, and now I run the fintech industry body. So actually, you could say disrupting um, the industry that, uh, that I started in. Um, and, you know, and I think it's really interesting as we go through millennials into Gen Z, the power of the consumer and what we're now seeing you know, for these children who sit there and have learned you know, to use a smartphone by the age of one or two. Um, as I always say, the same, the same kids who can kick a football um, are now using a smartphone and they're technology enabled. You know, and what that's going to mean to their choices as they come into financial services, whether it's you using one of my members, fintech companies, or the banks who are reinventing themselves, who also are my members, and looking at how they adapt you know, the whole products. But I do firmly believe they are going to be the consumer of the future. So whether we are looking at B2B or B2B2C, the choices we're going to see are going to be driven by that, by that Gen Z, who are very technically savvy and, you know, and sit there and want to have access to these products and understand how they, how they work. Thank you. Excuse me, sniffing away. I've got a cold. Um, Joe. You are in charge of a very new division within Barclays addressing millennial finance. Yep. Tell us a bit about that role and tell us why now and what 
what success looks like for you in that job. Fab, so I'm Jo um, and I work at Barclays. I'm actually on the cusp of millennial Gen Z, so I'm just on the millennial side. Um, my role at Barclays is really trying to understand um, what millennial and our younger customers are looking to do. Um, speak to them all across the UK to get what they want rather than what we, what we think they want and then make sure we're um, having products and services which work for them in a way that works for them to really make sure we're meeting their needs um, and understanding them rather than just doing what we think they want. And would you say that this generation even knows what it wants? I think that's an interesting question. There's a lot of complexity within it. I read a paper about the kind of duality between Gen Z and there's a huge range of needs that they have, a really diverse range of needs. I guess at Barclays we've got a base of 24 million customers who also have a really diverse range of needs. So even if they're not quite sure how, um, what, what they do want, there's a lot of things they can try and if something doesn't work for them, maybe over the phone, then they could come and see us face to face. There's lots of ways that we can help them figure out what they want. I suppose the reason for asking that, um, Charlotte, is because uh, is there a sense in which the financial services sector is playing catch up and sort of, you know, running to, to anticipate and meet the need, but they don't necessarily have enough time to, to truly understand or, or to respond to what they're hearing? I mean, how much of this is so new that we don't know yet? I mean, I think you know, nobody can predict what we're going to see over the next five, ten years. I think you're totally right. And that's why you're seeing people you know, who are going into the banks to try to understand it from within. Um, but you have got to change you know, a, a culture that hasn't changed in a, in a long time. Um, you know, and trying to predict that is, isn't easy. So I think you know, we see this with the neobanks, with the challenger banks, um, you know, who are sitting there trying to, trying to look at that consumer and talking to them on a very regular basis. So everyone who went through digital-only apps actually has now started putting call centers in so they can actually understand the needs of their consumers. And you, you're seeing the consumer wanting to be on the phone to someone, wanting to understand it a lot more. Um, so I think you know, they have a slight advantage. They're only going for a specific subset of the market, and they don't have the 24 million people. They have to, they have to work out what they want and retrofit some of that. They actually can almost start afresh and say, what, what is this next generation looking like? And Chloe, when you study this cohort, do they know what they want? Are they magpies for the new, or do they actually have a different technological requirement? Um, I think that's a, a complex question, because I think they know what they want, which is what anyone wants. I think any generation, I don't think that's specific to any new or older generation. You want to have security, you want to have money, you want to have safety, you want to have a sense that you can have things like um, a house or a family or a comfortable way of living. And I think that previous generations, even if you weren't wealthy, there was some sort of reassurance that if you kind of worked hard and when you into the sort of your peak earning years of 30 or 40, it was a natural order of things that you bought houses and had families and so on. And that's been completely disrupted because as of next year, if the economy keeps going on the way it is, the average age in the UK for a female to move out the family home is going to be 28, and for, for bo uh, males, let's say boys, males, men, it's going to be 31, which is insane because that is going to distort every process and natural order of kind of adulthood. You can't possibly think about getting married or having kids or doing all those things if you're living in your parents' basement, poor parents. Um, so I, I think absolutely that Generation Z want they, all those things, of course they do, if you speak to them, and indeed, you know, millennials, my generation. Um, but I think it's whether they can have those things. And there is, you know, as I previously alluded to, I think there is a sort of degree of responsibility of kind of older people to kind of assist them and kickstart and, you know, get rid of kind of low-paying jobs and the gig economy and free internships and this whole kind of, you know, the transference of wealth from young to old via kind of rent and stuff like that. Th those are all issues that, that can be discussed. But I also, you know, I think that with Generation Z in particular, there is this beginning, this sense, in a, you know, certainly from an economic point of view, of having to renew things and, and, and recreate things if systems aren't working for them. And I think a really good example of that is social media. 
but it's kind of written off as this kind of frivolous thing, which is all about Instagram and it's like loading up pictures of bikinis. But in fact, these have become very lucrative alternative economies that work really well for younger people. And they've become so successful that traditional industries and economy now depend on those things. So of course, it's not an industry that works for everyone, but you're seeing in lots and lots of ways, generations are starting to create things that basically are an alternative economy that are absolutely geared towards working for young people. That's a really interesting point, and I think we should return to the trend side, but just on the banking and the finance side, you've raised a very, a very also interesting point about the interdependency of other players in the economy, other factors. So, for example, I have a 20, nearly 21-year-old son who's renting his first flat at university. Um, the... The, the, the flat lettings agency will only accept parental validity <laughs> like of finance, which is a kind of whole headache and a half if anyone's ever been through that. But more importantly, they won't accept rent from the individual kids. Uh, and therefore, it forces the children, if you like, to yeah. stay children. They can't be economic. So I wonder whether you're alive to that, Joe. it's really a question for you. So it's not a mortgage, it's generation rent. Mm. But in fact, the tentacles of the system operationally are completely A, old tech, you know, and B, bypass that generation. Are you aware of that? Yeah, we are. So we spend lots of time talking to our customers. We know one of the big things they want to do is get on the property ladder. And it can take, you know, up to maybe seven years for them to save to do that inside of London and about four years outside. There's lots of ways that we can help um, the customers themselves to become more financially independent um, and help them, I guess, there's kind of outside factors like the landlords that you mentioned who rely on that, but we can really help the customers themselves become a bit more literate, understand their money and get in control of it. So at least when they go into these situations, they themselves are more confident um, and a bit more sure of what they need to do. So we can provide that education with them. Something we're um, working on at the moment and launching this weekend is called Money Mentors, which is um, some specially trained colleagues that help customers to understand their goals, manage their money better. And that's a really great way that we're helping them um, just get in control of their money. A lot of them want to talk about getting on the property ladder and that financial independence, moving out of home from mum and dad. So that's very much, though, in the literacy space, in the culture space, in the owning the space that you know, you do want uh, that generation to bank with Barclays. I get that. But there are quite difficult policy areas that abut that. Is that something that you're sort of, you leave your public affairs people to deal with and you're the customer facing side? Or is there an awareness that, for instance, issues like property are beyond the bank's control, but directly impact on the banking of your, of your new customers? So to the best of my knowledge, I know it's not just a public affairs, media relations type yeah. um, issue in the kind of the mortgage product areas. There are guys who lobby and meet with the regulators, I believe, to try and change things. If we're hearing things from our customers um, that they are really struggling with, then they'll try and lobby the regulators, I think. Um, but I can get back to you on that one. Because that... Thank you, Charlotte. That worried me. That sent a red flag to me in that I thought it's one thing to pay for the rent. It's another thing to have to kind of be intricately involved in the delivery of the rent when it's for somebody that's nearly officially completely adult. What, what's going on from a regulatory perspective? I, mean, you know, I, I spend a fair amount of time in, in, uh, in Whitehall and Westminster uh, for my sins at the moment. Um, you know, and what we're seeing is... you. Know, from the Department of Education, you know, I'm talking specifically to UK market, but it's very similar to overseas markets. We're just not seeing that shift in education as children come through 9, 10, you know, 14 to 16 to 18 to making these choices. Um, you know, how do we change the education agenda? And I've been quite shocked, I said, because I'm, I do, I do uh, sit there, I have my Gen Z at home, of how the fact she's still learning in this, the same subjects in the same way that I was doing you know, 35 years ago. Um, you know, and that's got to change. So what we're seeing is industry is slightly being relied upon to go into schools, and most of the banks are covering sort of two-thirds of schools around the country, slightly individually, because they're seeing it from a competitive edge. And you know, we have to work out how we can do that as industry to pull together 
to actually say, is there a program industry could put together collectively um, to go into there? So we're doing that with fintech companies so they can understand how they may you know, avoid a payday loan and they may be able to actually get an advance on their salary through a fintech company. But you know, we are now starting to talk to the banks to say, look, we have to coordinate on these programs because I don't think you're going to suddenly see this huge change coming up in the curriculum anytime soon. So just before I come to Chloe on a bigger point about the generations, because we've got some lovely questions coming in. So this is uh, as much behavior as it is technology, is that right? So do you want to just, who wants to pick up that point? How much of this is about the hardware of designing services and systems? And how much of this is about understanding that the generations below mine and some of ours here do in fact want something different from their financial services? I, th I think, um, I mean, this is encouraging because as a, like a young person, you obviously is like tapped into the mentality of young people. And like, I, I guess, I mean, this, this, no offense, but I think Generation Z are certainly that they're very anxious and they have massive anxieties. And there's lots of jokes about it, about interfacing with any one official people in the public. And it scares them witless. It's one of the reasons they hate going to restaurants because they're scared of talking to waitresses. And so banks like to scare the hell out of them. So I think it, it, it's really good that you're providing those services where they, they kind of feel, um, you know, it's sort of welcomed or it's, it's less intimidated. But to your point, I mean, and, and this is something I'm, you know, a massive critic of. I don't think the, uh, the, either the education system or the university system is preparing young people adequately in any way, shape or form for the realities of, you know, the economic market and all those things that they're facing and the, and the sort of practicalities of getting houses. So I think, and it's a really difficult monolithic thing, which I'll talk about a bit in my talk later on, but this, this notion, which I don't think it's that strange, of collaboration between the banking finance industry and schools and universities makes total sense. Mm. Because at the moment, they're kind of running parallel um, and, and, sort of, and, and there is this kind of complete mystification and fear. And you know, with, with kind of this possibility of collaboration or providing stuff online, because Generation Z learn loads of stuff online, it's where they seek out some of them, their primary learning. And it's really strange that there isn't as more Gen Z oriented learning resources provided by the industry who are the real experts as opposed to maybe like a business studies teacher. Yeah, there's a big gap in the market yeah, there, there really to is. break the silos. Okay, some, some comments that may be coming in from some of you in this very room. There's a view in our company, says Anonymous, <laughs> uh, that Gen Z are overly fussy and unwilling to do the tough parts of a job because they think it's beneath them. So this is a bit stage left, but I mean, it's about kind of the work readiness of this generation. Are we missing a point here? Are they work shy? Are they work resistant? I certainly sense that they want a life and a work life. I, I always, Chloe again. I always say with Gen Z, one of the criticisms is they want the noun, but they don't want the verb. So they want to be the thing without doing the thing. Mm. Um, and I, you know, and it's, it's very easy to sort of write them off as kind of these snowflakes or babies. But the, the trouble is now, and this isn't, so bad in every country, but I think in the West in particular, that everything is designed culturally to tell young people that they're wonderful. Parents tell kids they're wonderful. Schools tell their kids they're wonderful. Everything is kind of facilitated and done for them. Um, and everything is about kind of making everything, this, the passage is safe and is convenient um, and is smooth and is complementary to them as possible. And fundamentally, that, 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 that underprepares them for the workplace because no one in the workplace is there to make you feel good. You're there to do a job and if you can't piss off kind of thing. And that's such a shock to Gen Z when actually someone says, no, that's wrong, you can't do that. I spoke to a kid recently who got fired and I said, well, what did you do? And he said, well, I just kept turning up for work at 10 o'clock. And I said, well, what time is your start? He said, oh, 9.30. And he couldn't figure out why that was a problem because it had never been in at school and so I think it's not fair to sort of write off a generation if they haven't really been taught to know any better so again which you do see in lots of other countries I think they do better I think that it's actually focusing more on this preparation for life and that would do them so many favors and I think when you go to schools where there is that slightly more brutal you know leave them in the countryside to find their way back or there is that kind of 
uh, maybe more of an old-fashioned approach. In the end, it, there's lots of complaining about it, but in the end, are we doing kids any favours by totally mollycoddling them? So, Joe, you don't strike me as a mollycoddled person, but I do <laughs> get what Chloe's saying. If you wanted to wave a magic wand and make your cohort of customers literate, as you put it, what, what do you want them to be literate about? What does literacy, is it that you want them to be uh, fluent on different apps or you want them to learn how to save or what, what does that look like to you? I think it's, it's a bit of a fluffy answer, but I think it's all about confidence. So understanding their money and their situation and feeling like they have complete control about it. So they understand if actually the right thing for them is maybe to take out a credit card to help them build up a credit score. So then they have um, you know, a better credit file when they're applying for the mortgage. It's about equipping them with the confidence, whether that's through just talking through things or whether that's through the knowledge and the education piece they're missing. It's about I'd love customers to feel more confident and more in control of their money and then able to make decisions themselves for what they think is the right thing for them, but with a kind of solid knowledge base that they, that's an informed decision rather than just choosing the thing they see their friends doing. Or So it's interesting. I'm involved with a completely separate project uh, with another hat that I wear, which is all about soft skills and the soft skills revolution. That's sort of what I'm hearing here is that we're describing new ways in which to communicate mm. with a generation that whatever else it feels, it's sensitive. Charlotte, do you think there's some truth in that, that we, again, it's a hardware, software question? I mean, you know, we're definitely seeing, you know, and this actually relates to how you get a different type of um, diversity into your, into your organisation as well. Um, you know, we, we're definitely seeing you know, schools starting to teach uh, failure weeks. I love a failure week at school. Um, because they're saying, you know, we, they, these, you know, the millennials especially, have got to the point where they just can't cope with failure. And actually Gen Z coming through now, and this is more sort of the age of 10, so, you know, that, sort of, that part of Gen Z is sitting there and saying, you have to be more resilient. We have to, we have to teach them resilience um, and looking at those softer skills. So as they come into the workplace, I firmly believe that is going to add a huge benefit to, you know, to companies, especially to financial services. You know, I remember when I joined, you know, I joined the city you know, at the age of 23, all you really worried about was saving up for your deposit you know, sitting there, you know, potentially getting married, having kids, working that through, getting into a job where you're going to be comfortable to do that. And that was, that was the achievement of your life. And now, of course, you've got people coming to work saying, well, as long as I'm happy, I can pay my rent because I probably am not going to get a mortgage anytime soon, and I can go on a few nice holidays. That's fine. You know, and I find it amazing. And I, you know, I have a great team. They're very, very young, many of them. And again, the most exotic holidays. And I'm sitting there going, wow. So yeah, and that's it. But that, that's, that makes them happy. So it's how do we get that next generation to say, Where's your sense of purpose coming through? And that's what we're seeing, is the next generation is coming in and wanting purpose in their, in their work, and that is what's driving them to turn up at 9.30 and not at 10 o'clock. But for banks and financial institutions, is the risk a sort of under-engagement, under-usage? Yeah. Is that what, I mean, sorry to sort of be blunt here, is that what's worrying the business sector and the banking sector? That, that young people are going to say, well, I don't really, you know, yes, I need to have a holding operation of a bank account, but that's it. Is that really what you're wanting to do is stimulate a wider engagement, Joe? I think so. And it's just a cut to the chase. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we want them to take control of their own situation and, and just have the confidence, the knowledge, the education to take control of it rather than being a passive but just can let they, it happen. just to push back, can they take control if they're not in control? So if, for example, the, the structures around the service mean that they cannot actually uh, get a mortgage and that they cannot actually even pay their rent without yeah. it being validated by somebody older. Do you see what I'm saying? How yeah. much of it is a feeling that then they will be disappointed by? I think even for your example of getting a mortgage, there's lots of different ways you can get on the property ladder. There are okay. kind of lots of different products and services that don't necessarily require you to get that 10% deposit. So there are, um, I mean, it's hard to get on the property ladder, but there's different ways around it. And so you're optimistic. You yeah. would be because you're right. You yeah. are optimistic. <laughs> okay. I hope so. So, <laughs> so I'm going to run through. Well, I'm going to ask another question because lots of questions are coming okay. in, but it fits it. Chloe, does the new generation see a difference between Google and a bank? Do they see a bank as safer? 
No, I think that, I mean, this is, the, I think the, the bottom line is, is this is the first generation that have had some viable fundamental alternative to traditional banking. Um, you know, whether it's kind of these, uh, you know, banking apps or payment systems um, or, you know, indeed this kind of new currency like, you know, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, which, by the way, someone has to get in and, and sort of get, a, a, you know, a, a legitimate message out because the, the miss, the disinformation with particularly teenagers about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is insane. Um, and I find that, you know, that, that kind of, in, uh, you know, a lie travels fast and misinformation travels really fast on the internet. And they're absolutely convinced that, you know, just, just bizarre things. In the same way, I guess, maybe in the 80s, the stock market, everybody got rich from. Um, so, so, yeah, um, and, and what's weird is that something like Google, um, and actually Facebook is massively diminished, but let's say something like Google, they, they particularly Generation Z, still have quite a lot of trust in because it's so influential despite the fact there's been so much dodgy misdealing with, with the big tech companies. Um, whereas with, I think, traditional banking, there's really, really negative opinion. I mean, these were, they were children after the 2008 crash and they feel like that their lives have kind of been blighted by this thing. So I think, with Jen said, there's much more faith in tech than there is in bank, perhaps unfairly, but that's the reality. That's probably music to your ears, isn't it, Charlotte? <laughs> Much more faith in tech. I mean, the Go Henrys, the alternative um, systems. I mean, it, it is, but it's as important that we have, you know, this, I'm a great believer that the banks are not going to be left behind. You know, what the banks are trying to do is, is catch up, and they have to service, you know, millions of customers at the same time. So what you're seeing at the moment is obviously they're learning from fintechs, they're partnering with them, they're accelerating them, they're incubating them, sometimes investing them, and you know, we are no doubt going to see the next period where there is some consolidation in the sector or they build their own digital offerings. So I think it, it is really important that we do look at tech as a solution and not something we can be feared. It is a solution. Um, and you know, from my experience with every head of innovation at, at every bank, you know, it's, it's right up there in the boardroom you know, all the time. So I think yeah, we shouldn't sit there and say it's not going to happen, but certainly these, these challenger banks have a huge advantage that they can build it just for that new generation. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, and, you, and you have to look out here with, you know, with Starling Bank sitting right in the middle of, you know, right in the middle of that, uh, you know, that uh, hall out there, you know, just how we're going to see just a whole load of different, different uh, you know, products out there, and probably you're going to end up with your current account on your app, but potentially other products from other providers are also going to be offered if we really extend open banking into open finance. And that's so, when it gets really interesting. Thank you. So just before we open out with the house lights up, there's a very interesting question apropos that from um, Ramchandran Krishnamurti saying, Apple Steve Jobs thought he knew better what the customer needed and designed phones that were successful. How do you compare this with meeting what the customers want? So this is an innovation question. Joe, have you got some secret squirrel projects up your sleeve that we're going to read about that Barclays did? Can you give us any, you know, what, what, is, what are the simple innovations that are going to matter for your new generation? Is that what they want, something new? I think it's possibly a new way of, um, it's a new way of, a new communication channel into what we already have. So as a bank um, with over 325 years history, we've got the full suite of banking products that some of our competitors maybe don't. We can offer mortgages, current accounts, investment savings, all of that. What we're working on is new ways to help the Gen Z and younger customers to access that. So I referenced Money Mentors earlier, which is something which we're we'll launching this weekend. It's a it's a new way to help customers access all of the things that we have. Um, there are a couple of other projects that are being worked on, but it's about helping our customers know what we offer. And so a bit like O2 innovated by offering pop concert tickets, and that was the first time there was a kind of alliance marketing. Do you, do you think, to Charlotte's point, that other products and services may come in? I mean, Chloe, that presumably is quite a winning strategy potentially because they're very much a consumption generation, aren't they? I mean, yes and no. I mean, with greatest respect to you, I, my concern with what Joe's saying is I don't hear anything particularly new. Like, you know, and, you know current accounts and mortgages and, and so on. But what people have to understand, obviously with the exception of 
um, wealthy Gen Zs who have parents who can support them. This is a sort of generation who are, in some ways, almost a, a different financial species, and, it, and you know, and has become alienated from all the traditions. And you know, when you um, talk to so many of Gen Z, I mean, I would argue the majority, that notion of can we help you save a mortgage or, you know, or, or you know, save money, that sounds like kind of an idyllic fantasy to them. So I think the, the, the things that they, they, they kind of need to think about are that the absolute, you know, going back to the absolute basics, is that if you have nothing, you, if you are living sort of hand to mouth, gig economy, just about managing your rent with nothing left over, what facilities are there for you? And this isn't a few now, this is a majority. Yeah. And, I mean, we are seeing now the biggest financial division since the Second World War. I mean, it, the difference between, let's crudely call it the working class, the very wide middle class, and kind of, you know, the upper sort of wealthy class, is enormous. And I just don't see the banking industry providing for those many, many young people who do not have access to those, those very simple simple things that we should have and are actually living hand to mouth and barely making it like what do we do with those and you never see them in the nice adverts with the horses or the cool families or in their nice kind of London homes and that speaks for a lot of people. But is it the job of banks to meet that economic shortfall? I mean I think you would have to say that banks have to remain within a, a, a bandwidth and a spectrum of some kind or another. No, I, I don't. You know, I, I, I completely agree with you. They're not charities, but at the same time, I think it is facing that reality and I think that reality is going to sort of widen. Um, uh, you know, the, the economy doesn't look like it's going in a, in a good direction. So no, I completely agree with you that they're not charitable sort of institutions and you know, I'm sure that they would like, you, you know, I mean, we're beginning to have talks about this kind of idea of generational reparation, which is a whole other conversation. But the, but the, the fact is, I think that lots and lots of young people really feel alienated from the kind of the, the banking design and structure just because it's, th th there, there is no way they can fit into that. Well, that's a positive note on which to <laughs> ask for the house lights to be up. Um, and I'm assuming that very helpful people with microphones are going to come to you. Would anybody like to make a real live comment that doesn't go through Slido? Old school. Old school. Mm. Might have to pick on people near the front <laughs> row. Do you want to do it all through Slido and be very technical? Yeah. Final call, if anyone. Yes, there's a hand. There's a real, there's a live hand over there. <laughs> Please say who you are. Yeah, hi, good morning. I'm here. Hi. Hello. Now, hang on. I'm looking. Where am I looking? Over yep. There. Oh. Hi, good morning. Hello. Yeah, interesting, uh, interesting talks. Thanks for that. Uh, quick question. Um, the way we see it, in my humble opinion, is that generations, Generation Z is very disruptive in the way um, they communicate in the way they work, in the way they behave, and all the examples you gave uh, highlight that. Uh, so do you think in the end, and here I'm speaking about mid to long term, 10 to 20 years, they would be disrupting the traditional banking industry? Good question. Let's start with you on that one, Charlotte. I think they're definitely going to keep them honest. You know, I, think, you know, I think the banks currently have the brand that can be there to partner but you are going to definitely see new entrants coming in. Um, there's no doubt about it. And to the point you know, on financial inclusion, we're not seeing solutions coming out of that yet. And I'm always quite embarrassed when I talk to, you know, to, to peer groups in India. You know, and we have one and a half million people unbanked in this country. 60% um, of adults who have less than 100 pounds in their bank account. But India, you know, with, through the India stack and Aadhaar, you know, gave a 12-digit you know, ID number and solved some type of identification for a billion people. Um, so who's teaching who? You know, so I think it is about sitting there saying, what is that consumer there? Do they, need, do they need your rent deposit? You can now get an insurance product for that rent deposit. Can you, do you, can you wait until Friday to get your pay? No, I can't, so I'm going to go to a, maybe it is a fintech company, maybe a bank, and I'm going to go and get that on a Monday night so I don't have to go to a payday lender. I think what we're gonna see is much, many more of these products are gonna be so much more mainstream that they're just going to have that choice there. At the moment, it's still relatively niche, um, but you know, fintech companies have taken 13% of banking revenues you know, within this sector, so we have to sit there and assume we're going to continue to see the disruption, and when we really get that out there, you know, especially in the UK, really across the country, and then further afield into Europe and US, I think you will see you know, some disruption, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't write off the banks either. You know, I think they're, they're learning fast. 
Thank you. Let's Thank you. go over there. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Brandon Stanford. I'm a student ambassador from Cass Business School. So I think I can uh, represent the millennial culture and what we've been talking about. So my question is, um, any potential uh, strategies for attracting millennials and Generation Z? And also, uh, how do financial institutions pretend to retain our loyalty? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm a visiting professor at CAS, so I'm very happy to have taken your question. Joe. I feel like you're the politician in the room, the bank <laughs> in the room being told, what are you doing, what are you doing, what are you doing? What are you doing to attract and retain your new cohort, your special division? Um, so there's lots of different things we're working on. I guess for those millennials and Gen Z who are more digitally active, um, the Barclays app and the app that we've got, we're introducing lots of new features there quite regularly. So things like spending, which allow you to track how much you're spending, lots of features around control and really helping um, customers to manage their money how they see fit. If they want to set a spending limit so they can't spend more than £20 a day, for example, that's available at the tap of the button on the app. And if you change your mind, you can just tap that back off again. So there's lots of features we're offering digitally on the app so that you've really got a bank in your pocket to help you keep that control and, and stay in control. But also things, um, we've got humans, right, that a lot of our competitors maybe don't. And we've got people who can there to help you in a way that suits you, whether that's over the phone or through video call or maybe in one of our branches. Well, I'm very happy you mentioned human uh, and uh, I'm, I'm giving a talk at two o'clock in the spotlight about the human in the machine age. Chloe, given that this generation does feel anxiety, how easy is it for them to get through or their perception to reach a banking human uh, if they've got a problem? In other words, if they are confused about the state of their bank account or they want to know if they can borrow money or so on and so forth. I mean, is that human track perceived to be good between Gen Z and the bank? Well, I mean, we've all sort of become a bit kind of AI addicted and sort of mechanized, which is I think for everyone. But there is a, a perception which is probably wrong with Gen Z that the industry only cares about people with money and it's out to kind of, you know, harm you or, or ignore you if, or if, if you you know if, if you're kind of a younger person um, and I think that lots of kind of banks in the industry are starting to kind of break through that message and that kind of um, and provide you know more specialist services for younger people and you're seeing that much more in the mainstream and I think that that kind of chips away at this perception that it's like completely uncared for and careless um, and, and there is kind of, you know, that kind of notion of expertise and a kind of a comforting voice, um, which I think ultimately generations there probably do appreciate. But I think it's exactly that thing that it's, it's not just a generic system. It's something for their, them and specifically their needs, I think would be really encouraging for them. So, Joe, does that mean that if um, an 18 year old uh, goes abroad, is not near their family, leaving aside whether you know, they've got any funds whatsoever. I mean, I think uh, there, there is a separate session about uh, a lack of money, but sure. generations that have sufficient funds but n need to learn to manage them. How easy is it? Because if you're a grown-up and you're trying to contact your bank by telephone, I can tell you it's not easy, <laughs> and I defy anyone to tell me that it is easy. So why is it easier for the Gen Zs, and can I have some of what they're being given? <laughs> So um, if you, for example, go onto the Barclays app and you, there's, a, there's a button there, you can just click direct call. There's no need for you to provide any authentication. You've already done that by using your touch ID or passcode to get in. That takes you straight through to one of our colleagues um, in our contact centers who can help you. So it's relatively easy for you to just get through to somebody. Video uh, or audio? Yes, yeah, so we've got video and telephone calls that you can access from your app. And so what about the bots? Do bots and millennials go well together? Um, <laughs> I think that they can work really well, but they, if they're clever enough to interpret what you're saying, they can work really well, but there's definitely still such a huge place for a person who can really understand you and not do it based on you know, an uh, algorithm or something, but actually understand you and question you to help 
get to what you want. So Charlotte, I love the sound of this, but in, an, in other words, what I'm hearing is that Generation Z could be the generation that reconnects the financial sector to the obvious, which is too much technology is not so great, that there's a certain point when you just want a person with yeah. a voice who's not programmed. Yeah. Yeah. We've seen this with the, you know, with the challenger banks when you know, many of them just went digital only, almost impossible to call someone. And then they, they rec recognized that actually the segment that needed them, which actually was you know, sometimes the, the elderly and the more vulnerable, were the ones that were actually calling them at night and sitting there quite worried about, you know, some, about money. Um, so I think it's not just even the millennials or, or Gen Z, it's actually all parts of the sort of vulnerable parts of society. But I think you, what you were seeing now is they're starting to put those call centers in. They don't need a lot of them, but they do need to have something as that backstop that somebody can call. I still personally believe a Gen Z, they will believe an app and they'll believe something they see on the internet or on Facebook or on Apple more than they're going to sit there and trust going into a branch. So I think it's, it's finding that balance of how do you get through the waves of something that's so digital you know, and so easy to use on the app that they can use it and not have to call someone, but also having that person there if there's financial trouble or they're worried or that's something and they have got someone to actually speak to. I think you're going to find a balance. That says it, a fine balance between the tech and the machine. There's a, there's a woman straight in front of me. Hello. Hi. My name is Adriana. Um, I want to introduce a new persona because I haven't heard it yet, and I am personally more concerned about that type of gen set. Last summer, I spent it with a son, seven-year-old, and he told me two things. I mentioned I was working in cybersecurity, and he said, oh, let me show you how I hack into my school system to score A's. And he actually demoed it. He went on the code and changed, and the things will go to the right multiple choice answers. And then he said he wanted to be a crypto miner. And this is a seven-year-old. <laughs> and so my thinking was, which I expressed to my friend, his dad, he's either the next Mac Mark Zuckerberg or the next owner of the dark web. <laughs> so what are we doing to ensure that this generation if they, and they will, outsmart the system, they'll do it for the right reasons and that it will not become multiple owners of the dark web type of scenario. Well, it's a great question and it is the elephant in the room question which we need to touch on now, which is security. Mm -hmm. But also, I think a very elegantly put question about security used for good purposes and bad purposes. Chloe, just what is your sense about security and it, the high trust that your generation, the generation you speak of, puts in technology? Does that make them easy marks when the technology is compromised? Well, first of all, it's a great question, and I would actually recommend you adopt that kid. You know, they're, 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 they're going places. <laughs> um, and actually, a seven-year-old, it's, it's, it's actually Generation A. It cuts off about 12 generations, and then we go to Generation A, which I'll write about in 2021. So, you know. Um, but, I mean, yeah, I, I do. I think that I don't, I mean, you know, I think that with baby boomers, like my grandma can't go online, she can't open an email without losing all her money to a Nigerian prince. So I think that um, Gen Z uh, naturally, you know, they're kind of tech, uh, they're the tech generations and, and, they're, and they're sort of very natural with tech. And so I think they're inherently have kind of almost sort of innovative inherent systems in place where they inherently understand technology because they've grown up with it. But that being said, um, I do agree that there is, I mean, there's a huge both kind of safety and moral and ethical question about this, this, this uh, security and this faith we place in technological systems. And, and I think that Gen Z, I think one of the things, and also millennials, I think they're a bit romantic about the notion of tech and kind of like the, the big tech companies. And they ultimately, they see them, I think, you know, about this kind of... Um, um, new, uh, sort of, and it's almost like this new versus tradition, and they feel like this is their generation and they're fighting the system and old people. And I think that the big tech companies kind of exploit that. So though I think that it's a mistake to say that, that they're vulnerable, because actually I think they're much less vulnerable than older people, I do also think that there needs to be much better conversations about kind of, the, the, you know, the awesome power of technology and how much we're giving over to those technology companies and, um, um, you know, whether that's sensible. 
Will you let me very helpfully thank you to Joe because I wanted to ask you about privacy. Um, I happen to bank with Barclays and was using my iPad to go on to the web because that's the way I go in, that's the system I trust. And my 14-year-old said, why don't you use the Barclays app? And I heard myself say a bit stupidly, oh, I don't know about that. I think that they could get my data. <laughs> Hackers. And he looked at me very sympathetically and said, mum, it's a lot less secure via the internet than it is via the app. Um, which told me as much as anything else that he'd thought about privacy. Is that what you think this cohort cares about? Speed and efficiency and kind of the glamour of new tech, but they, they do not want to be hacked. We'll come to the question of whether they want to be hackers. Is that right? What do they care about in terms of cybersecurity is really my question, Joe. So from what I've heard from speaking to them, it's all about safety and control, but ease at the same time. So they want to be able to do things conveniently and it not be too too much friction so they have to enter you know their inside leg measurement to get into their app but they also do value the fact that we take security seriously it's really important for us to make sure things we're delivering to customers aren't putting them any detriment and we're looking after their data and taking that really seriously so I think it's a balance of making sure we are being really secure and safe with what we're doing, but also making sure that doesn't hinder the experience and allowing them to do things as quickly as they'd like to. And how quickly, therefore, do you think you could recover if there was an intentional malicious hack designed to compromise you with that generation to say it's not safe? It, it's a trust question. How, how, how resilient do you have to be with this particular generation? To be honest, probably not quite my um, area of expertise. I don't think there's a difference between how careful we have to be with this generation versus others. Everyone with banking wants to have that security and make sure that they have that trust in us. But I'm probably not um, the best person well, for that. Well, but that's helpful because, Charlotte, that really was another elephant in the room for me is we're talking in this session about Gen Z, but is it helpful to really silo out generations? Because to some extent, as universality, we do all want privacy and safety and security, don't we? How different are they as humans? I mean, I think, you know, I think you should worry more about AI probably hacking than, you know, I mean, it's, it's, I, I quite want to harvest a seven-year-old, but, you know, but, uh, but I think we've got to look at m more what AI is going to bring into this rather than just a human element. I think, you know, banks are pouring millions and millions into sitting there making their systems resilient, you know, with their cyber officers. You know, they're now coordinating with the National Cyber Security Center. You know, there's secondees going between both. So actually what you're seeing is we're working with central agencies to ensure that you know, they understand the risks being brought in by this new financial services um, you know, journey and vice versa as well. So I think you know, we, have to, you know, we have to assume that as much is being done as possible, but you know, when I was working you know, in uh, one of the big exchanges, you know, this, was, this was constant. Every day you were sitting there and there was hacking attempts every single day, thousands and thousands. So you know, people get very smart about it and they, you know, they learn from some of the younger generation they learn from you know, the technology available to them, but also, as I said, it is, it is working with central government, with the clearinghouse, with the regulators to ensure that they are as resilient as they can be. And don't assume that they're going to be able to hack into your central core system before you get an alert on the way through. Thank um, you. Well, we've actually only got five or six more minutes left. I gather you have somebody. Hello. Yeah, my name is Ms. Femi Olaguloye from Wema Bank in Nigeria and I'm the head of central operations of the bank. My question is, Generation Z is very fast and highly impatient with desire for more ideas and technology. Now, how do we reconcile or how do we meet the expectation of Generation Z with digital immigrants working in the traditional banks? And how, how fast are the regulators preparing to meet the demands of this Generation Z. Thank you. Thank you. So is the old system creaking at the seams? We know when cash points fail, it's usually because a bit of code that was built in 1970 and added onto in 1982 has just finally gone. How, 
how much of a concern, I'm going to spare Jo on this question for a minute, <laughs> just because um, uh, she, she can't be in the, in the firing line, but Chloe, what, what do you feel about the, the adults beyond the ages that we're describing protecting them as well as uh, meeting their high expectations. Do you feel that Generation Z, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm gonna ask you, do you feel they're in safe hands? Oh, do, do I feel Generation Z are in safe hands? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think that fundamentally, and I, I imagine it certainly is the case in the banking and finance from what I've seen, is that there has to be more of a collaboration, that there is enormous strengths that people from different generations have. And I, unfortunately, I think that particularly with the media, it's a very sort of media clickbaity thing to pit generations against each other. And it's been really successful, like millennials versus baby boomers. Now they reckon the new one is Z versus X. Um, and it's a kind of a form of prejudice, and it's one of the, what, really one of the last forms of acceptable prejudice, and it really winds people up. So I think that we would do so much better, and this is certainly true in my observation in every country, if there was this greater collab collaboration between strengths. So if you come from a generation that's great for tech, great. If you come from that more traditional thing that's perhaps more human-focused or is really good at sort of saving or has really good ideas about kind of more traditional systems, that's great as well. But collaborate, don't fight against each other, and then I think there will be that real more security. Here's a question from Vishnu R. Dusad. I'd love to know what the R stands for. <laughs> uh, is the attitude of millennials any different when it comes to acquisition of assets like a car thanks to the Uberization of transport. So let's, let's begin to wrap up on trend. What are the trends that are impacting on the services and the rollout of ultimately quite traditional things like bank accounts, access to money and so on? So Joe, is there an Uberization? Is there a different kind of way of looking at money amongst your generation? in the way that you, they, they do use Ubers. All my kids use Ubers. <laughs> um, I think so. Um, I think there's a trend towards shared ownership and it's the house is still really important, but other things are moving more towards experiences maybe, rather than physical things. And actually they want to have fun today and enjoy what they're doing, go on that holiday as you mentioned earlier, um, rather than necessarily owning tangible things. Um, and yeah, yeah. Is that why perhaps sponsorship and those alliance marketing things are going to remain incredibly valuable tools? I come back to my point about O2. I mean, presumably, if Barclays is seen to be in with those other experiential brands, that's going to be good. Yeah, and it's about offering things to our customers. And there was a comment earlier about loyalty and rewarding customers, giving them the experiences of the things we know they want as a result of banking with us. So I think there's definitely lots of great partnerships we can do working with different um, players to make sure that we're giving the best to our customers. Yes, thank you. Charlotte, that loyalty question really interests me. I think we had a great wave, didn't we, in the, in the early 90s of the loyalty card, the customer <laughs> loyalty card in retail, in supermarkets. And I feel that's a very under underappreciated aspect of customer relationships. Is that presumably something that fintech could meet the needs of incredibly easily? I mean, it is, and it's also it's the power of the data, which we haven't really had time to discuss. You know, what data are you giving away? You know, so loyalty cards. Why do they give those to you? Because they want your data as your buying buying uh, patterns. And this is what you're seeing. In the old days, when I walked into the bank in my local town. And I bought, you know, I got my first bank account. I went back to that bank to get my first mortgage, to get my first savings product, to get my insurance. I'm still actually a convoluted way through the same insurance company, although it's been acquired three times. You know, and what you're going to see now, I think, is almost come back full circle, going too much information, too much fragmentation. So who's going to be the one that consolidates it across? And you know, my, my traditional bank app that I use, I won't say who it is, um, you know, they, they sort of you know, spit out occasionally this, you know, this incentive for me to go and you know, do something else and you know, go and spend so much money on this and we'll give you a, a cash back. It's got to be much easier than that. And this is where I think you're going to see these partnerships come in 
between traditional banks, between fintech companies, and providers, you know, between experiences. As you say, people aren't going to buy a car. I think they'll lease a car. Guess why Ford and Tesla are spending so much money on insurtech and data? Because they're going to give you that whole that car with an insurance product that's tailored to how you drive. So it's everything you do in your daily life is going to be captured, and that data is going to eventually drive the products you use. Leads me to the final question, which um, is a really good one. Uh, another anonymous person, so I don't know their first name or their last name or their middle name. Will Gen Z be a prime target for big tech to trust and use their global coins like Facebook's Libra? What should be the proper response from incumbents? So apropos cross-fertilization of platforms, apropos Tesla selling you the car and the insurance, let's have a final word about the defining technology of the time, which is basically social media. Uh, over 200 million people in a year coming on stream to a different new social platform. So, Chloe, what's your closing point apropos social media and technology and possibly the new tech finance kids on the block like currencies? I think the, what, um, the, the, sort of the psychology of any kind of social media and the more it happens is effectively this um, drive towards individualization because people have become both the creators and consumers of their own reality. And that's exactly the point of social media. It's not like traditional media where someone said, you will read this, you will watch this, you will think this, and we're, we're bending your kind of thought processes or your likes or desires. Social media is your own platform and it's kind of representation of not just you, but your reality. So I think that um, the, the absolutely both, both kind of industries and the, the kind of tech platforms is that absolute, that, that kind of um, assurance that they're kind of nurturing that individualization and enabling that because that is really at root what, what it is and that's really important to Gen Z. So this time next year we'll have to have a panel with somebody from Facebook on it talking about Libra. Except, except not Facebook because Gen Z hate Facebook. They say it's full of old people. <laughs> a challenge within a challenge. Joe, social networks and marketing finance to Gen Z? Yeah, so we know that our customers want to see us not just in the traditional places they expect, like on the high street, for example, but where they are. And if we can get messages out, show them how we are there to help them, how they can come to us in a place where they're browsing, like their Instagram feed, for example, that can go down really, really well. As long as we're not kind of interrupting their uh, rabbit hole, they're going down thinking about holidays and we're reminding them to pay their bills. We know that you know, there's huge value in us being where they are and being in their lives rather than expecting them to always come to us. Charlotte, social media and fintech being in your life, that's, again, that's good news for you, right? I mean, you know, we, we, do, we do talk to the tech giants. You know, what I can see is they're going to be more, much more of the tech piece rather than the financial services. So they're going to be connecting up, like we've seen in China, connecting up that, you know, this institution through this, their tech platform and back out to bank the other side. Um, you know, I think it's interesting when you know, the, the new story from Facebook about we're using WhatsApp payments was actually going to be launched from London because of our adoption of fintech um, you know, and into the Indian market. So I think you, what you're going to see is they're going to be part of that ecosystem. I don't think we can assume they're not. You said it comes back to that data. Three and a half billion people are adopting one of those, you know, one of the Facebook, Instagram pieces. And where's that e-commerce data going to go? And can the banks really sit there and, and catch up and have the same data where they can compete with that? That's the problem. Well, Part partnerships is everything. Thank you. I would describe what we've heard this morning as sort of uh, optimistic realism. Uh, there's quite a lot of challenges. There's quite a lot of desire to meet those challenges from the end this way. I'd like to thank Charlotte and Joe and Chloe and you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.